to go. They honk very loudly to let us know that they are arriving. And they built their nest on the rooftop just outside of our uh, building here, just across from, from where I sit. So I watch them come and go, building their nest, etc. But that's how I know for sure that spring is here, because I believe the geese. I don't necessarily believe the weathermen. OK. Once again, I'm very grateful to those of you who have corresponded with us by phone, by email, and in person, letting us know that these sessions are making a difference in your lives by helping you to understand the various aspects of Parkinson's and the symptoms that challenge you on a regular basis. I also appreciate the questions you send in to my executive director, Debbie Davis, who kindly passes them on to me. So once again, Debbie's email address is debbie.davis at parkinson.ca. So please keep those questions coming in. If you are listening for the first time today and you would like to hear the sessions from the last three months, these sessions are being taped and are available on our website. Just go to www.parkinsoncno.ca. Click on PDTV along the right-hand side of the home page, and you'll find the link in the middle of the page, Sandy's Lunchtime Presentations. If, for any reason, you are having difficulty accessing these chats or would like to speak me to me directly, please don't hesitate to give me a call at 416-227-3375 or, if it's long distance, one 800-565-3000, extension 3375. I would be very happy to hear from you. As April is Parkinson's Awareness Month, in honor of Dr. James Parkinson, who was born on April 11, 1755, in London, England, I wanted to start today's chat with a bit of background about the history of Parkinson's disease, including treatment and research. I have no doubt that some of you on the line today have absolutely no interest in this topic, but please don't hang up. Just bear with me for a few minutes because the other part of my chat today is about some of the psychiatric symptoms and behavioral changes, a topic that may be of interest. Of course, if you have no interest in either of today's topics, feel free to hang up and get on with the things that do interest you. The nice thing about these telephone sessions is that you are anonymous. You get to come and go as you please, and no one knows the difference. So, now back to the history of Parkinson's. The truth is that researchers don't know when Parkinson's disease was first discovered. But there is evidence that medical scientists have been treating Parkinson's for thousands of years. Symptoms and possible treatments for Parkinson's are discussed in Ayurveda, which is an ancient Indian medical practice that has been around since 5000 BC. The first Chinese medical text called Nei Jing mentions a condition that is, sounds very much like Parkinson's, and that was more than 2,500 2, years ago. The first clear medical description, however, was written and published in 1817 by Dr. James Parkinson in his An Essay on the Shaking Palsy. Parkinson was a doctor in London, England, who observed what are now known as the classic symptoms of Parkinson's disease in three of his patients. At the same time, he observed three other people at a distance as he walked around the streets of London, who also had the classic symptoms. I am referring to the characteristic resting tremor, rigidity, abnormal posture and gait, and diminished muscle strength, as well as the very slow progression that he observed in these six people. Although Dr. Parkinson encouraged the medical community to study this condition, his essays and finding findings received very little attention until 1861, 40 years later. 
Between 1861 and 1881, several neurologists, in particular a French neurologist by the name of Jean Charcot, used Parkinson's observations as a base point and advanced the understanding of Parkinson's disease, distinguishing between rigidity, weakness, and slowness of movement. It was Jean Charcot who championed the renaming of this disease in honor of Dr. James Parkinson. In spite of ongoing research and a variety of treatment and trials, I hasten to add, with many errors along the way, that there really weren't any effective treatments for Parkinson's for many decades. In fact, it was thought to be a terminal illness and that is why it received very little interest because doctors felt and researchers felt really there was nothing that could be done. Time does not, me, does not permit me to list many of the previous treatment trials, but I'd like to share a couple of ones that I found to be particularly interesting. Keep in mind that the neurologists who were trying these various therapies continue to this day to be very well respected in the field. So these trials were being done by brilliant geniuses back in the day. The first one I want to tell you about was performed by Dr. Charcot, that French neurologist I mentioned a few minutes ago, who really advanced the understanding of Parkinson's symptoms in the 1800s based on Dr. James Parkinson's original findings. Dr. Charcot re rejected most of the medicines that were around at the time and advocated vibratory therapy for the management of Parkinson's. Yes, you heard me correctly. I said vibration therapy. He based that on the observation that after a long carriage, train, or horseback ride, his Parkinson's patients experienced a marked improvement in their symptoms. He actually developed a device to replicate the same rhythmic movement of the carriage, train, and horseback rides, and he was sure he had found the perfect treatment for his Parkinson's patients. His electrically powered shaking chair, which is what it was called, along with a helmet that vibrated the brain rather than the whole body, didn't pan out, hmm, wonder why. Didn't pan out exactly the way he had hoped. So, please don't dash out and buy a horse and carriage or expect that your next long train ride is going to eradicate your Parkinson's symptoms. That's just not going to happen. An even more unusual and hazardous treatment that Charcot and some of his learned colleagues looked into was the use of a suspension apparatus to stretch the spinal cord. Using gravity and the patient's weight to put excessive vertical traction on the spinal cord and the nerves in the spinal cord, patients were hoisted into midair with a pulley and a harness. As you might have guessed, the serious side effects of stress on the patients both physically and psychologically, led these doctors to abandon this strategy shortly after its introduction. So the next time you grumble when you have to pop a levodopa pill in your mouth, just think, if you lived in the 1800s, you have either been vibrated or stretched to no avail. Also, in case you think surgery for people with Parkinson's is new, Back in the 1940s and 1950s, neurosurgeons began to perform surgery on people with Parkinson's. And while the surgery was effective, unfortunately, without the advantages that we have today and the new understandings and technologies that we have today, surgery was very risky back then. And an average of at least 12% of patients who underwent surgery for their Parkinson's died as a result of the operation. The risks are much, much, much less, uh, less um, serious today. So the surgical options, i.e. deep brain stimulation, 
are a blessing indeed. The biggest advancement in Parkinson's treatment came in the 1960s, when researchers identified the differences in the brains of people with Parkinson's that were associated with low levels of dopamine, a brain chemical that allows for smooth, coordinated movement. This research revolutionized the treatment of Parkinson's disease and led to the development of levodopa, which is still the cornerstone of Parkinson's treatment today. In 1961, once researchers proved that levodopa was the forerunner to the production of dopamine, human clinical trials were started, and the following results were published and relate to patients who had only been diagnosed for a few short years, and I quote, bedridden patients who were unable to sit up, patients who could not stand up when seated, and patients who, when standing, could not start walking at all, performed all of these activities with ease <clears throat> after being given levodopa. They walked around with normal movements and they could even run and jump. The voiceless, slurred, and unclear speech became forceful and clear as in a normal person." Unquote. Clinical trials continued over the next few years, which confirmed both short and long-term benefits of levodopa. And in 1969, levodopa was established as the premier agent to treat Parkinson's symptoms. A, de a description that it maintains to this day. Since that time, the late 1960s, new medications and formulations have been developed, many of which play a part in the management of Parkinson's symptoms. But none of these discoveries rival the discovery of the miracle we now know of as levodopa. It was a miracle indeed, and I consider myself blessed to have witnessed this miracle firsthand in my personal life. I was a student nurse in the 1960s, the early 1960s, and several of my Parkinson's patients, even though they had been diagnosed for only a few short years, were completely de dependent on healthcare professionals for their care. I also had a aunt with Parkinson's, and I always felt very sad and helpless whenever I went to visit her. My aunt, along with several of my patients in the hospital, was chosen to participate in the first clinical trials of levodopa. And following that, my visits with her went, and as well as my care of my patients with Parkinson's, changed radically. These folks who could not sit, stand, or walk were now doing all of these things independently I went from sitting beside my aunt's bed, holding her hand, unable to understand a word she said, to enjoying a cup of tea with her outside in a garden, having a wonderful conversation and lots of laughs. This memory continues to bring me joy and hope for people living with Parkinson's on a daily basis. So what lies ahead in the future of Parkinson's treatment? Researchers in every country throughout this world are continuously working on ways to slow the progression of Parkinson's, looking for new ways to restore lost functioning and help prevent the disease from developing in the first place. Tremendous progress has been made over the last few years, and although you and we here at Parkinson's Society, including myself, get impatient while we all wait for the next miracle, don't forget how long it took to develop the first miracle. I know it won't take another 150 years, as there are already exciting treatments in the pipeline, such as promising new medications, as well as new surgical t targets, um, as well as the new criteria now for doing deep brain stimulation surgery. Researchers know a great deal more about the brain than they did back in 1817. Therapies that may soon be available include 
transplanting healthy dopamine-producing tissues into the brain, and finding medications to prevent dopamine-producing brain cells from becoming lost or damaged. We're not there yet, but as I said earlier, you're not being vibrated and you're not being stretched, so be grateful. I started all this history stuff again because April is indeed Parkinson's Awareness Month. So there's just one more thing I want to mention on this topic today, and that is the origin of the Parkinson name and what is the Parkinson tulip. So I've talked to you a little bit about Dr. James Parkinson back in 1817, but I wonder if everyone out there today knows how the Parkinson tulip came about. The story of the Parkinson tulip actually began in 1980 in the Netherlands when a gentleman by the name of J.W.S. van der Werld, I know I'm not pronouncing that correctly, so for those of you of Dutch origin, please forgive me. A Dutch horticulturalist who had Parkinson's disease developed a red and white tulip. In 1981, van der Werld named his prize cultivator the Dr. James Parkinson tulip. So, to honor the man who first described his medical condition and to honor the International Year of the Disabled, including those with Parkinson's. The TULIP received the Award of Merit that same year from the Royal Horticultural Society in London, England, and also received the Trial Garden Award from the Royal General Bulb Growers of Holland. And it is described as a flower, exterior, glowing cardinal red, small feathered white edges, outer base whitish, etc., etc. So please, whenever you see Parkinson's TULIP for sale, or if there's going to be a Parkinson tulip selling event in your area, please don't hesitate to either volunteer for that or maybe to buy a bunch or two to brighten your home. April 11th um, in 2005 was actually launched as the Worldwide uh, Parkinson's Day to celebrate uh, World Parkinson's Disease and the uh, Worldwide Tulip. Okay. On to the second topic for today. I don't know about you, but it was of great relief for me to read this following st statement that I came across. Forgetting some information sometimes is normal as we age, and don't I know it. It does not mean you have dementia. It just means you're getting older and there's not anything anybody can do about that, unfortunately. So now that I'm going to discuss cognitive impairment, I just want to ensure that you put the, follow, the next uh, group of things that I'm going to say to you in perspective. Everything is relative. Healthcare professionals, myself included, often use what I call doctor speak. That is, we use medical terms, phrases, and words, forgetting that to those individuals who are not in the medical field, we are speaking a foreign language, which indeed is a waste of everyone's time. So today, I'm going to start with what is, in my opinion, one of the scariest medical phrases we often use without thinking, cognitive impairment. I believe that when many people hear the words cognitive impairment, they automatically think it means they have dementia, and that is simply not true. Let me explain using some of the contents in the non-motor guide as well as some other documentation. Cognitive impairment simply means problems with thinking and understanding. That actually affects a large percentage of people in the general population and certainly a large percentage of people with Parkinson's. Just because you have Parkinson's does not prevent you from having some of these other concerns as well. These problems can and often are even more disabling than the movement or motor problems and difficulties. 
These problems may be part of the illness or they may result from treatment. I will now list some of the common symptoms of cognitive impairment to ensure that we're all on the same page. And these symptoms that I'm going to talk about now are under the umbrella of mild cognitive impairment. These include problems with memory and the ability to concentrate and pay attention that are bothersome but don't really affect daily life. Difficulty with planning and arranging events in chronological order. I think a good example of this is someone, if you're a, a good cook or you love to throw big parties and you do the cooking for those things. In order to be able to uh, have a dinner party, one has to be able to plan who you're going to invite, of course, first and foremost. It's no point having lots of food without people who are coming, so you need to plan your invitation list and send it out. You need to plan your memory. Your memory. See what I talked about a few minutes ago? I lose it too, guys. Sorry. You need to plan your menu would be the word I was trying to say. Okay. And then once you've decided on what you're going to serve, you need to buy the ingredients to go into the recipes for that menu. Then you need to be able to bring it all home, put it all together, and in the past, I'm sure you will have no problem putting together those recipes and producing wonderful meals. But you see all the steps it can take just to plan something that maybe used to be easier for you, planning a dinner party. Even having one couple for dinner is a challenge for me sometimes. So this kind of planning and arranging in chronological order, no point in sending out the invitation after the fact is what I'm talking about can be very difficult for people with cognitive impairment. Does that mean you don't have friends over? No, you just plan it differently. Okay, difficulty following a conversation in a large group. Often this goes hand in hand with slowness of thought and expressing thoughts. So, for example, you're out with friends for the evening and there are several conversations going on around the room. You're having some difficulty keeping up, and by the time you process the information and want to express your thoughts because you do find that you have things that you'd like to say, unfortunately, the conversation has gone on and everyone is talking about a completely different topic. This often leads to isolation, and people with Parkinson's feel there's no point in going out as they can't even participate in the conversation anymore. I remember listening to a, an interview uh, with Auntie Barry about two years ago, and he said having been a broadcaster and an interviewer, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of people listened to his wonderful morning talk show on CBC, he found this problem absolutely forced him to isolate himself. He actually went and lived alone on a farm outside of Toronto because he just couldn't keep up with the conversation. He had to turn down a lot of uh, invitations that he received because this was a big problem for him and one that he just simply couldn't come to terms with because he just couldn't keep up with the conversation. Another problem when we come to mild cognitive impairment is difficulty changing topics quickly or even losing your train of thought when you're talking. I do that all the time. I call it getting derailed and I count on other people to get me back on track. Difficulty making decisions can be another problem. So you may have been a person in the past, especially if you uh, were out in the working uh, field, uh, that you were able to make snap decisions about all kinds of things. But now making those decisions, you're more hesitant. You don't have the same confidence in yourself that you used to have. Solving complex problems can certainly be very challenging. Problems with word finding. I call it the tip of the tongue syndrome. You know what you want to say. It's right on the tip of your tongue. 
Do you think you can utter it or get it out there? Not right now, you can't. So some memory issues are also involved with mild cognitive impairment. Forget forgetfulness, problems with retrieving learned information. I call it trying to retrieve memory from the memory bank. Sometimes when I'm trying to remember something, I go to the memory bank, but the teller at that particular memory wicket isn't available right now. So I basically have to leave the bank without being able to retrieve my memory until the teller comes back on duty. That happens to me quite often, actually. But do I worry about it? No, I just think, OK, it'll come back to me at some point. Unlike the serious memory problems, such as those seen in Alzheimer's, for example, and people with Parkinson's memories, uh, they can often be stimulated if they're given little hints or cues. I refer to this as cueing. So sometimes people with Parkinson's can respond very, very well to cueing. Just give them a hint about what it is that you want them to remember, and they're off to the races. But that wouldn't happen if the memory problems are indeed very significant and very severe. I would be lying to you if I said that people living with Parkinson's never de develop dementia. In most cases, however, it's important to know that dementia in Parkinson's occurs very late in the disease, in those who have very advanced or late stage Parkinson's, as the abnormalities in the brain start to spread outside of the areas involved with movement and into the areas involved in thinking. Dementia is one of those medical terms that can be misunderstood. Basically, it describes thinking and memory problems that are severe enough to interfere with day-to-day -day functioning. So I'm going to give you the example that I often use of the, of the keys. You've lost your keys. You can't find your keys. But eventually, you will remember where you found, where you put them, or you will come across them, probably where you always leave them. At any rate, the difference between losing your keys and eventually finding them is the difference between that and not knowing what to do with those keys when you do find them. Big, big difference. Keep that in mind. Mild cognitive impairment, forgetting where you put your keys. Major cognitive impairment, dementia in this case, would be somebody hands you keys or you find a set of keys, but you have no idea what to do with them when you find them. There is a big difference. So what can you do? Some researchers believe that staying cognitively active and doing brain activity or mind activity games, such as the Duco, crosswords, learning a new language, luminosity, there are all kinds of things out there to keep your mind active. Also, it's important that you switch from one to another, as this may be helpful. Don't just do the same mind-brain activity all the time. Switch them up, so keep challenging your brain in that way. Also, our old friends exercise, good diet, well-controlled blood pressure, cholesterol levels, keeping those under control, these are all very helpful. So once again, memory, attention, and scientific brain games, such as Sudoku, we call that cognitive training, are, have been found to be very helpful. Keep your mind active. Other possible treatments include medications. There are several out there, Aricept, Exelon are two of them. But if you're finding that these are severe challenges for you and are really affecting your day-to-day -day life, please talk to your doctor about your cognitive function. It is important to note also that some medications used to treat other features of Parkinson's such as medications for sleep problems and anxiety, sometimes worsen your cognition. So 
So make sure that your doctor knows all the medications that you are taking. And by the way, early cognitive changes, such as the ones I referred to at the beginning of this part of my talk today, are not predictors for more serious problems to come. We cannot predict which patients will, disable, will develop the disabling problem of dementia. Many people just retain the mild cognitive impairment throughout their journey with Parkinson's. In previous talks, I have mentioned some of the behavioral symptoms associated with Parkinson's, such as depression, anxiety, apathy, and fatigue. Today, I want to talk about drug-induced behavioral and psychiatric symptoms, as I believe many people experience these difficulties, but don't talk to either their families or their doctors about them because they are embarrassed or they are afraid they are going crazy. This topic, like so many other topics, is fraught with many misunderstandings and misinterpretations. So I want to start today by clearing up some of those terms, some of that doctor speak. The drugs used to treat Parkinson's are designed to affect brain chemistry and as such are not restricted to just targeting your ability to be able to move. They can also produce behavioral changes and psychiatric symptoms such as vivid dreams, nightmares, disorientation, hallucinations, delusia, delusions, and paranoia. I will describe each of these terms a little bit further on in the, in the, talk, in the talk today. Many people take several medications at once. Perhaps you take levodopa to increase the amount of dopamine in your brain so you can move more easily. Another drug to help levodopa to work to its full potential. And maybe, maybe you take some medications for depression or anxiety. Doctors often have a hard time determining which medication is causing which side effect. And sometimes no one drug is at fault and the problem is caused by a combination of several drugs that multiply their effect. So it stands to reason that side effects can be diminishing, diminished by decreasing the number of drugs and simplifying the medication schedule. Easier said than done, I'm afraid. The real problem is that Parkinson's progresses. As a result, People require higher dosage of levodopa, for example, to control their motor symptoms. You know, those symptoms, tremor, stiffness, slowness, etc. And is it, it is indeed these higher dosages that cause the psychiatric symptoms, such as hallucinations and delusions. So if you have levodopa-induced hallucination, it makes sense that the hallucinations will be eliminated by reducing the levodopa dosage. But if you do this, you will be unable to walk independently. Hmm, a catch-22 to say the least. Your current medications will need to be adjusted, and you may need to take different medications to produce the greatest benefit with the least side effects. Once again, you need to tell your doctor what is going on as these problems must be managed on an individual basis. It is important to understand that people who have had Parkinson's for some time may develop behavioral abnormalities even though they are taking the same dosage of medication that they have taken for many years. So some people are really perplexed about, but I've been taking this same dose, the same medication for years. Why am I having these problems now? It's like it's a cumulative effect. Not toxic, but it just is the fact of the fact that you have now 
more advanced Parkinson's disease. Sometimes even a small change, such as a slight increase in dosage or the introduction of a new drug, for example, a sleeping pill, can trigger, trigger the emergence of the behavioral symptoms. Any of the psychiatric symptoms may be induced and worsened following an operation, such as hip surgery, or an infection, such as a bladder infection or pneumonia. Last but not least, a small number of people living with Parkinson's abuse their anti-Parkinson's medications. They take more than has been prescribed because they think, well, if four pills a day helps me, I think I'll just take six or even eight. As a result, unfortunately, they are very likely to develop psychiatric side effects as a consequence of this addictive behavior. So it is very important to take only what the doctor has prescribed. Now for more explanations of some of those psychiatric symptoms I referred to a few minutes ago. Vivid dreams and nightmares have a very realistic quality to them and can be very frightening. Sometimes they are so vivid that people confuse what is real and what is a dream. If the dreams and nightmares are accompanied by talking, screaming out loud, or violent thrashing movements, this is known as rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder. And that is often so disruptive that bed partners need to sleep in a separate bed or even in another room. If a small reduction in anti-Parkinson medication fails to relieve this problem, then other things, for example, melatonin and another medication called clonazepam may be needed. Please talk to your doctor if you're experiencing REM sleep behavior disorder. Visual hallucinations, which are visual misperceptions, cause a person to look at a real object, such as a garden hose, and see a different object, such as a snake. This comes under the category of perceptual changes. Things that are ill-defined at the side of your vision can often be misinterpreted as being something else. So perceptual changes are a tendency to see things that you know shouldn't be there, especially at night. For example, you might waken in the night to look at, and look at your bedroom curtains and think you see a person in the room. Upon further investigation, however, you realize that it was just the curtains. Again, you mistake one object for another. Another example of this, have any of you ever gone camping, wakened in the night, and wondered if you're looking at a tree, or is that a bear? It's like the phantom, a phantom image where objects are mistaken for something else. Sometimes, after a discussion with your doctor, a change in your dopamine replacement medication can help these phantom images to go away. But again, let him know what's going on. Now for the topic of hallucinations. Hallucinations are not vivid dreams or illusions of the type that I've just spoken to, or, nor are they phantom images. The difference is that the individual who is hallucinating is seeing or hearing things that are not really there. But it is very important, I will emphasize that again, the person who is hallucinating is seeing or hearing things that are not really there. It doesn't matter that no one else can see these visual images. You can see them if you're the person who hallucinates, and you know they are there. And no amount of somebody saying, don't be silly, there's nothing there, is going to change your mind about that. It is your reality. In Parkinson's hallucinations, almost all are always visual. 
Again, you see things that are not there. They usually begin as minor and can be very non-threatening at the beginning. Maybe you see an insect, a spot on the wall, or the floor that moves. And these images can progress. Maybe you see little children, miniature people, or even small animals. These are known as benign and they are not bothersome or problematic. These hallucinations are partly related to Parkinson's affecting the parts, areas of the brain involved in interpretation of visual images and are partially related to med medications that I've already talked about today. Not all hallucinations need to be treated. The benign ones don't need to be treated unless they are really bothering you. Seeing little animals or little children may not be the least bit bothersome, so they don't really need to be treated. But please don't be afraid to talk about them, because if they progress, it can become something more severe, then your family and your doctor needs to be aware of what it is that you are seeing. These can often be helped, so again, discuss them with your doctor. You are not crazy. You wouldn't hesitate to talk to your doctor about your tremor or about your stiffness, so please don't hesitate to talk about your hallucinations. They are another symptom and they can be treated. If the hallucinations are a problem, your doctor may try reducing some of your medications, but if this makes you too slow, too stiff, or increases your tremor too much, your doctor may, pre may prescribe an antipsychotic medication, such as clozapine or Seroquel. There are other medications that can also help. Let your doctor know. The last psychiatric symptom I'm going to discuss today are delusions. Delusions are quite rare in Parkinson's disease, but they do occur and they can be very troubling for not only the person who has the delusions, but certainly for the family members as well. Delusions are false beliefs that are not based in reality or fact. As I've said, they're uncommon, but they're very problematic. These, like hallucinations, mainly occur in advanced Parkinson's. Individuals with Parkinson's who have delusions become very suspicious, and the suspicions are most often directed at family members. For example, the person with Parkinson's will accuse their spouse of having an affair, or they may think that money is being stolen from out of their bank account or out of their wallet. A person who has delusions may also feel unfairly persecuted. They experience what are called paranoid delusions. They think that decisions have been made that are unfair to them. There is some research that evaluated why patients with severe advanced Parkinson's are admitted to nursing homes. And to be honest with you, the most common reason was hallucinations and delusions as families were unable to deal or to manage these symptoms at home. Fortunately, and I want to emphasize this, that these set of complex problems can be dealt with, but again, you need to talk about them. Doctors can't treat what they don't know about, and you don't need to suffer. So just to summarize, hallucinations and delusions may be eliminated or reduced in severity by changing, reducing, or eliminating some of your anti-Parkinson's medications, like your levodopa, for example. If anti-Parkinson's medications can't be eliminated because of an unacceptable increase in your motor symptoms, a number of drugs are available for treating these psychotic symptoms. The key point here is that low dopamine levels cause Parkinson's symptoms. High dopamine levels cause psychosis. It truly is a catch-22, but there are treatment options. Don't keep these problems to yourself. It's not your fault, 
you're not going crazy, and you can get the help you need. For those of you caregivers out there, if you are having difficulty in knowing how to react and respond to your loved one who may be having hallucinations or delusions, I do have a tip sheet. So again, use the information that we provided with you. Either write to Debbie Davis and ask her for the tip sheet or uh, call me and I'll be happy to send it to you. Okay. That's all for my that part of my prepared um, presentation for today. So I just want to go over some of the questions. Oh, hang on a second. Okay, sorry. Okay, are we back online? You're back online. Okay, thanks. All right. So I just wanted to go over some of the wonderful questions that I have received. And thank you again for um, sending these questions to me. So I'm going to get through as many as I can. Um, I realize that it's about quarter to one. I think I'll be able to finish by one o'clock, but let me try. Okay, so here's one question. There are several members of our group, myself included, that suffer from hearing loss. Hearing loss is not related to Parkinson's disease, I know that, but more due to our advancing age, along with other medical reasons. It becomes, however, a Parkinson's-related issue when one person's voice is weak and they are trying to communicate with someone who has a hearing loss. Any suggestions? Hearing loss is difficult because it's invisible. The person listening does not know what they are not hearing and the one speaking is unaware that they are not being heard. So, he, as this gentleman has, has indicated, this is not directly related to the topic, but any suggestions would be helpful. So just as a matter of interest, I have a friend who is a speech language pathologist, and her husband deals with individuals with hearing loss at a clinic. So one day, they decided to test out this problem. So the gentleman um, who deals with hearing loss he took the care partners at a support group into a room and he tested their hearing. And the, my friend, who is the speech language pathologist, took the individuals uh, with Parkinson's into a separate room and gave them some tips and cues on speech and how to make your speech heard and improving the quality of your voice. Interestingly enough, they collaborated at the end of the session and shared their findings. The gentleman who was dealing with the caregivers with hearing loss found that, get this, 68% of the caregivers that he was dealing with and had tested their hearing had some hearing loss of varying severity, but none of that, those 68% had any idea they had any hearing deficits at all. Of course, people with Parkinson's are constantly told that they have uh, low voices and whatnot. So again, speech is very important and being able to communicate together is very important. So I guess the lesson learned here is that people with Parkinson's need to ensure that their voice is enhanced by um, having speech uh, language pathology lessons, lessons in, in, in voice, and as well, uh, everybody as we age needs to have a hearing test, hearing test, I should say. So I, again, I did, dealt with voice and speech last time around, and for any individual who would like, I can send you the uh, two tip sheets that I had after that session on voice and Parkinson's disease, speech problems and Parkinson's, and bottom line is there isn't any therapy other than a hearing aid for hearing loss, so I en encourage you to go out and um, get a hearing test. So, for example, on the tip sheet, I just wanted to say um, it says uh, some of the, the cueing here things are, my husband or my wife needs a hearing aid. I just want to get what I ordered in the restaurant. I don't answer the phone anymore. 
I used to go for coffee, but I stopped because my friends can't hear me. I speak, but nobody responds. It's like I'm not even there. I can't imagine anything worse personally. So again, these things all mean that you need to have an evaluation and speech therapy. So please address these issues. Um, also, there are classes out there, music therapy, etc., that can also enhance your speech. So again, if you would like further information on this one, please don't hesitate to, uh, to ask me. So I received a question of, uh, one, around um, this gentleman who, the good news is, he was diagnosed about four years ago, and coincidentally, six months before his diagnosis, he took up Tai Chi, and he actually did some years ago, but he'd gotten away from it. But now that he's back doing his Tai Chi, he has no problems with balance, and he's also practicing something that we call mindfulness medication. Uh, meditation, mindfulness medication. I've got medication on the mind today. Um, at any rate, he was wondering about something called neuroplasticity and exercises for that. I'm going to talk about exercise um, in my next uh, session. So hang in there. Bottom line is that all exercise is important, but I just want to debunk the myth about this new word in all of our vocabularies now called neuroplasticity. What is it and what does it mean? I'm going to address that next time. Another question that I had um, is about um, wondering how sensitive is Cinemet to even small quantities of protein. This uh, gentleman has stated that he can see that a big steak dinner or something that contains a lot of protein the half hour before or two hours after his dose would interfere um, with his Parkinson's medications. But again, he's in the habit of having some snacks in the morning or afternoon that do contain uh, small amounts of protein. And he feels that the uh, fact that he shouldn't have any protein is in interferes with his um, ability to be able to basically enjoy life. The truth of the matter is that there are only so many uh, receptors in the digestive tract and any amino acid, which is what the protein in the food turns into as well as the um, amino acid that your medicine, Parkinson's medication turns into, uh, can sometimes leave your medication uh, sitting in, in the gut where you don't want it to be as it will your medication does not start working and providing symptom relief until all the protein is out of the symptom, out of the system. So if this gentleman has further questions on that, I would be happy to provide him with a sheet on medication absorption uh, concerns and whether or not. But the bottom line is any protein can interfere with the absorption of your medication. So a couple more things, and then we're going to have to close for today. One is um, a lady uh, kindly sent me a tip. And by the way, don't just send me questions. If you have found tips of how you live well with Parkinson's, etc., please don't hesitate to share those with me as well. I'd be happy to pass those on. We all know that everybody with Parkinson's is different, but any and all tips that you, that you find helpful, I'm sure other people would find helpful as well. So don't hesitate to share them. So the, a lady shared with me to after last month's session um, on drooling and related problems. She said her nighttime solution has been a baby uh, soother. She pins it to her jammies, as she calls them, into her pajamas so that it doesn't get lost in the bed. But she finds if she puts something in her mouth, and in this case, it's a nighttime baby, a baby soother um, routine, she finds that that really helps so that she doesn't wet, waken with a very, very wet pillow in the morning. This lady has also um, made other suggestions, and I'm going to um, try to get in touch with her if I can, because she's asking for some of our 
handouts, um, such as the preparation for a neurologist, neurology appointment, um, nutrition, diet management, um, etc. So I'm going to contact this individual and make sure that she has some of our, our tip sheets. Um, so another gentleman asked me about um, exercise that's good for Parkinson's, and as I said, I'm going to deal with, with some exercise questions next time. He wanted me to ask, uh, to talk a little bit about the value of walking poles. So again, for this gentleman, um, the effects of flexibility, uh, walking, Nordic walking with Parkinson's disease, I was able to come up with at least six different very promising research results comparing exercise and Parkinson's uh, and walking and the influence of Nordic walking, training, etc. That um, So obviously there's a lot of uh, researchers looking at this and the reality is that all the results are extremely positive. And uh, again, I think if you just uh, or had the opportunity to chat with any people with Parkinson's, as I do have the opportunity to do on a regular basis. I have heard nothing but really good um, uh, results of people using their poles because it assists with balance, because you're having a pole on both sides. It helps with posture. It helps with all kinds of things. So one last question for today. Um, and that is that um, what about uh, naturopathic medications? Now, again, I'm going to first topic for next month, and uh, Debbie will send this out to you, is going to be on medications. Um, depending on how much information there is, I'm also going to uh, talk about exercise next time as well. And I'm going to include naturopathic medications in my talk um, as well as the prescribed medications um, because I, I think it's important to ensure that everybody has a good understanding um, about where and when naturopathic medications uh, can be used. And um, so next time it's going to be on medications. Just so you know, I have a list. I can't say that I know exactly um, what topic I'm going to talk about in, in which month, but I can give you a list of upcoming topics. So May is going to be on medications, and I believe I will also be dealing with some exercise. In June, I plan to deal with Parkinson's and dental care. I have discovered, thanks to some feedback that I've received from a couple of individuals who have had some recent challenges um, with their uh, dentition, shall I say, uh, there's a lot to be said about Parkinson's and dental care, so I'm definitely going to deal with that one. I plan to do a session on balancing falls and freezing. I'm going to do one on Parkinson's and travel, Parkinson's and eye movement, um, and uh, also on nutrition, etc. So the next eight months coming up, there will be, I'm hoping, some topics that will be of interest to you as you as we go along. Last but not least, very quickly in one minute, I just want to let you know that a very recent, in fact, on April the 9th, we received um, some research information on studies that were done on does Parkinson's increase the likelihood of nocturia or nocturnal polyuria. So, Bottom line is nocturia is def defined as getting ha having to get up um, at night at least once, if not twice, during the night to urinate. And polyuria talks about the total amount of urination that occurs at night. And just for those of you who think that it just happens to people with Parkinson's, you're wrong. The prevalence was not higher for either of these problems than in the general population of the same age. So guess what? As one who has to get up at least once a night to go to the bathroom, it's about age. It's not just about Parkinson's. Like I said, we can't blame Parkinson's for everything, guys. Just get used to it. Okay, 
Looking forward to seeing you, uh, at least talking with you, um, in May. Hope that you have found this beneficial. And once again, happy spring. Remember, the geese are here. Love you all. Take care. Bye, guys.